imagine. And then as you prayerfully imagine, imagine God doing immeasurably more. Immeasurably more. I uh, can't wait to get into the message this morning, but I want to take a moment uh, first to thank Andy and Jason Knight. You know, I popped in here all through the week, and every single day I was here, they were dismantling uh, the old stage and putting all of these things up here, and it looks great, you know, creating this warm and welcoming environment. So I just want to thank Andy and, and Jason for the great job. And all of these were donated uh, to us by our friends at FCF in Frederick, so it didn't cost us anything. So that's the other great news. Uh, also, a big thank you to our Director of Communication, Trisha Corman. Trisha, would you stand? Uh, this amazing lady worked so hard to create the booklet, our all-in DRCC website, and our app, and all of the graphics, and uh, I could just go on and on. You know, she worked so hard, and then the whole team, Megan, Jason, uh, a whole bunch of people worked so very hard, so grateful. We have a fabulous staff, and I'm just so grateful for our staff and our volunteers. Um, Welcome also to our folks in the overflow room. I can see Hans and Alicia there. Welcome back. Is that the Larocas, Frank and Katie? Um, actually, at the count of three, would you guys say hello, overflow people, just so they feel welcome and don't feel like we left them behind? All right. Um, one, two, three. Hello, we love you. All right. If you have your Bibles, turn to Second Chronicles chapter 25. We're going to come and take a look at a story found in 2 Chronicles 25. Put a finger in there and then find your way to Colossians chapter 3, verse 17. I'm going to come back to those in a few minutes. Also, in your sermon insert, you will find a heart-shaped post-it note. Would you take that out? Everybody just take out the heart-shaped post-it note and make sure you hold on to it. I'm going to tell you what to do with it at the end of the service, okay? And now you're really curious to know, what is he going to ask us to do? Uh, it's not going to be something crazy. It's going to be something meaningful. And so just hold on to it. I'll tell you what that is when we come to the end of the message. So here we go. We launch our all-in journey this weekend. And I want to get to the message, but I feel like before I get into the message, I want to say a few words to those of us who are visiting with us. If you're visiting with us, for the very first time, you have landed at the outset of a journey of generosity that we as a community believe our Lord Jesus Christ has called us to in this season. And so I want to spend a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit about us. My name is Rajendra Pillai. I serve as one of the pastors here at Damascus Road. And I want to tell you a little bit about who we are. So if you're a member here, just yell out this question so I can answer it for our visitors. Just yell out, who are we? Let me tell you who we are. So for the sake of our visitors, we are a community of Christ followers that are on different stages of their journey. Some are just exploring their beliefs about God. Some are just starting out in their faith journey. Some have been following Jesus faithfully for decades. We are a community that is currently working closely with Jesus to create a world where there are no more clumsy or uncomfortable relationships between people of different races. There's a follower of Jesus Christ by the name of Paul Foss who's crazy about this. <laughs> Catch him if you want to know more about this. No more people suffering in the silence of their addictions and grief. No single moms or dads feeling awkward about being a part of a community of God where everyone loves everyone. All are welcome. Anything is possible. No one's perfect. We are a community full of marketplace leaders and craftsmen and artists who use their leadership, management, and gifts to help transform our world. Many of them serve as our elders, trustees, and ministry leaders. We are a community that is currently on mission with Jesus to see that our region produces hundreds and hundreds of children and teenagers becoming men and women of character who hunger after righteousness. Yes. Just to be clear, we are a community that believes you don't have the power to fix the world or save anybody, but we follow the crucified carpenter of Nazareth and we actually believe that Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth and therefore we go to places like Frederick and Appalachia and Central America and Africa and India to make disciples of all nations. Yeah. That's who we are. Yeah. Now, again, if you're visiting with us, we are a community that believes our Lord Jesus Christ has laid before us three major objectives, something our elders and trustees and staff and leaders have wrestled with for two years. And as you saw in the video, our vision is to be a prevailing, healthy, regional church committed to making disciples of Christ. 
And to do this, we are embarking on a generosity journey with Jesus to achieve what we believe are a God-given three objectives. Again, if you're visiting with us, let me tell you once again what these three objectives are. We're going to create additional space to enable spiritual growth, a new auditorium featuring 800-plus seats accommodating 2,000 people per weekend, larger lobby to enable relationship building and next steps, and a doubling of classroom space by transforming this existing auditorium. We will create an accessible state-of-the-art outdoor venue where our neighbors can experience community and expand our impact through local missions and partnerships to bring the hope of Christ to the under-resourced. We will increase investment in partner churches to feed the hungry in Central America, house orphans in Africa, share the gospel in Germany, and equip our sister churches to minister to poor people in India. If you're visiting with us, we hope you will join us. We hope you will join us in the soul-shaping, heart-changing, life-transforming journey with Jesus, even though over the next six weeks we'll be talking about the exciting and challenging mandate God is giving to those of us who call DRCC our home church. Now, for all those of us who call DRCC our home church, you've been hearing this for a while. And here we are, the starting point. So I really wrestle with this. You know, I was like, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you have for us? How do we launch this journey? How do we start this journey? A big goal is 100% participation. Everyone has a part, no matter how big, no matter how small. And so I kept coming back to the verse we selected for this journey together. It comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians. And so find your way to Colossians 3.17. This is what Paul writes. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. All in. All in. I know sometimes when I'm studying a verse or just reading it in my personal devotion, I like to read it in several different versions. How many of you do that? It just makes a verse come alive. How many of you have the U version app on your phone? It's such a great verse. You know, there are over 200 versions just in the English language, and you can just tap into it, and you can just select whatever version you want. I mean, technology is amazing. I encourage you to do that. So look at this verse in the message translation. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master, Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. One Bible teacher puts it this way. Let every activity of your lives and every word that comes from your lips be drenched with the beauty of our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. Every activity, every word be drenched. Love that. And bring your constant praise to God the Father because of what Christ has done for you. But I really like the Hindi translation. This is what it says. Or tum jo kuch bhi karo ya kaho. Jo kuch. Say it with me. Jo kuch. Whatever. Wo sab. Wo sab. Isn't that great? Wo sab. Say it with me. Wo sab. All in. Wo sab. Prabhu Yeshu ke naam par kaho. Usi ke dwara tum har samay parampita parmeshwar ko dhanyabad dete raho. Isn't that great? I just love the Hindi translation. All in. See, the only way to claim Jesus as your Lord is to be all in. Actually, Jesus makes this really, really clear. One day, an expert of the law comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus says, Love the Lord your God. And just look at the number of times Jesus uses the word all. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. It's the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus said, love God, love people, love God with all your heart. According to Jesus, the most amazing, remarkable, greatest thing you can do with your heart is to submit it, give it fully to God. Living our lives to the full means we will have to rise up against the drift, the pull of the current, and refuse to be dragged downstream by the current of inertia. It will involve sacrifice. It's going to cost us something. Some will look at the cost, and they will say the price is too steep. Some will walk part of the way and then walk away. It will not always be easy. But for those of us whose hearts have been captured, those of us whose hearts have been justified and unified and occupied by the resurrected Christ, this is a chance of a lifetime. So we stand at that point where we, each and every one of us, we have to make a decision. Are we going to be all in 
Or are we going to be somewhat in? Are we going to be all in? Am I going to be all in? Am I going to be fully committed? Or am I going to be somewhat in? Somewhat committed. I want to take a few moments and walk us through the story of a guy in the Old Testament who thought he could be somewhat in and still be committed to God, still follow God. And it had disastrous consequences. So find your way to 2 Chronicles chapter 25, and we're going to track this guy's story. And you have probably never heard a sermon on Amaziah before. We're going to change that today. We're going to talk about Amaziah. This whole sermon is going to be about Amaziah. Because his story starts out so well, and then he sort of lost his way. There's actually one phrase in his story that just startled me when I first read it. I want you to focus on that for a bit. So, 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verse 1. Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Jehoadan. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. That's a startling phrase, isn't it? Here's a king who aimed to do what was right before God. He came to God. He wanted to follow God. He was all excited about it at first. He was part of God's community. He heard the word. He understood what God wanted from him. He was to love God with all his heart and do what God told him to do. He did do it, just not wholeheartedly. He was somewhat in. And I wonder if this happens to some of us sometimes. We come to Jesus, we love Jesus, we come to church, we want to live a good Christian life, but there's some part of our lives that remain outside His reach. Some part of our lives that remain outside His Lordship, outside the reign and rule of Christ. So how did this happen for Amaziah? What made the writer of Scripture describe him this way? I want to track his story. And I was actually looking at this on Friday morning through the lens of Colossians 3.17, and I noticed something Very interesting. You can actually divide chapter 25 into four stages. There are four stages that happen in Amaziah's life. He went from all in to somewhat in to barely in to not in at all. And I believe that every single one of us in this room, we are in one of those stages. You're either all in or you're somewhat in or you're barely in or you're not in at all. And so we're going to track these four stages. Let's go a little deeper into the story and see how this happened. Let's start with stage one. Stage one, Amaziah started off great. He started off all in. He became king after his father Joash was murdered by his own officials. And Amaziah's first act was to punish those officials. Now the prevailing custom was, if somebody killed your father and and you became king, you killed everybody in that family. Not just the males, but the females and the children and the grandchildren. You just wiped that family out. But the text tells us Amaziah did not do this. Very interesting, verse 4. Yet he, meaning Amaziah, did not put their children to death, but acted in accordance with what is written in the law, in the book of Moses. He spared the children in accordance with God's laws as as it's laid down in Deuteronomy chapter 24. This is remarkable. Here's a young man of 25 years of age. He has immense power, and he starts off great. You know, there's... Tremendous advantage to starting off great. That's why we invest so heavily in children and youth. You know, Jeannie Foss, our former director of Children's Ministry, used to say this often, and you heard Richard say it. We say it so, you know, so often in our, in our different circles. We say it's so much better to prepare the next generation than to repair them. And especially to our young people, I want to say start the right way. Love God with all your heart. If you're new in the Christian faith, just start right. To all of us who are in this stage, you're all in, stay all in. Stay all in, stay fully committed. See, Amaziah's father had made the teaching of the law, the reading of Scripture, a signature accomplishment of his reign. And it's not difficult to imagine that when Amaziah was a little boy, he probably sat around listening to Scripture, listening to teachings happening, and he remembers those things. And he started off right. But then he moved to stage two. He went from all in to somewhat in. Stage two, small compromises. Small compromises. So he begins rebuilding the army and he drafts 300,000 soldiers. 
a battle was brewing with the Edomites, and Amaziah wanted to make sure he had enough troops. So he hired 100,000 additional mercenaries from outside his kingdom for the sum of 100 talents of silver. Enter a man of God who tells Amaziah, this is a bad move. Amaziah, you should have consulted God. You didn't do this. It's a bad move. Verses 7 and 8. A man of God came to him and said, Your majesty, these troops must not march with you. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy. For God, God has the power to help or to overthrow. Now I want you to notice how Amaziah responds. This is absolutely fascinating. He should have consulted God. He should have prayed. God, what is my role in this plan? What do you want me to do? Instead of acting in faith, he acted in fear. He made a functional calculation of what he thought was the best way to go. He decided to hire mercenaries. Now, God is directly telling him, get in the game. I'm with you. Love me. Trust me. Follow me with all your heart. Stop making these so-called compromises. And here's how Amaziah responds. Verse 9. Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about the hundred talents I paid for these Israelite troops? He takes out a calculator and starts doing a financial calculation of what it's going to cost him to follow God. What about the money? That's what he's saying. What about the money? What about the cost? He quickly jumps to doing a cost-benefit analysis of following God. And I can imagine the man of God shaking his head when he says these words in verse 9. The Lord can give you much more than that. Much more than that. This is not about the money, Amaziah. It is about the heart. Do you even realize, Amaziah, who you're dealing with? Stop being somewhat in. Be all in with God. So Amaziah fired the 100,000 soldiers he had hired from outside his kingdom, but only after being assured that things were going to turn out right for him financially. He followed God, but not wholeheartedly. You know, Jesus talked about this very thing in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no one can serve two masters. You cannot live with a divided heart for long. You will end up being devoted to one and despising the other. You cannot inhabit two stories. You will eventually have to choose. And there are consequences to living the wrong story. Those 100,000 fired soldiers, they are furious. And they cause a tremendous amount of heartache for a whole lot of people on their rampage back to their homes. Still, Amaziah's obedience leads to a great victory. And I wonder if anyone is here, and in some area of your life, you've made some small compromises. You want to follow God, but there is an area of your life that is outside the reach of God. There's some area in your life where Jesus is not Lord. Maybe it's relational. Maybe it's some secret sin you think no one knows about. Maybe it's financial and you haven't trusted God with your finances. Maybe it's those little lies, a little bit of deceit, a little bit of gossip, and a little bit of betrayal. That can change today, right here, right now. You can go from somewhat in to all in, right here, right now. Because here's the danger. A little bit of sin doesn't remain a little bit of sin for long. It grows. It grows. A life that is somewhat in, a life that starts making small compromises, doesn't remain there for long. It often leads to the third stage. And we see this in Amaziah's life. Stage three, major drift. He went from all in to somewhat in, and then he enters the stage of barely in. It's like he still wants to connect with God and his community, but the way he's living his life is another story. While it was customary for victors to plunder the land they had conquered, Amaziah actually goes further. He brings back pagan idols and gods, and he installs them, and he starts worshiping these foreign gods. He went completely off script. Because you cannot live two scripts. You cannot live two stories. Eventually, you're going to have to choose. You start making small compromises. It leads to big compromises. It leads to major drift. And you st you'll have to make a decision. Am I going to go down this path, continue going down this path? Or am I going to turn around and find God and read the story and live the story that I was meant to live? Now, God in his mercy sent a prophet to remind Amaziah of the life and plan God had for him. But the text tells us Amaziah got mad at the prophet. He got mad at the prophet. He tells the prophet, here's what he tells the prophet, verse 16, stop. Stop. I don't want to listen. The prophet is bringing God's word to him, but Amaziah says, stop. 
You know, I've been in ministry 20 plus years, long enough to have encountered people who just don't want to listen. And I'm going to say this with as much compassion as I know how. One of the saddest things I've seen in my life are people deliberately making destructive choices. One of the saddest things I've seen in my life, people deliberately making destructive choices. When help is available, when restoration is available, when redemption is available, when the road back to health and peace and healing is available, it's painful to watch. It's like people put blinders on. You know, several years ago, um, I met a guy. He doesn't come to a church anymore. And he wanted to have a cup of coffee and seek my advice about something. And we met. And he started talking to me. And I'm going to just condense the whole conversation. Basically, what he was saying is he wanted to divorce his wife. And, he was, and I started to probe. And he really had no good reason. And finally, I looked at him and I said, is there another woman involved? And he said, well, yes. You know, this woman I met at work. And I like her. And I feel like she's my soulmate. And I looked at him. And I said to him, you're going down a path of destruction. You're deliberately making a choice. You're deliberately moving towards sin. You're starting making small compromises. This will only lead to more and more heartache for you. Your life is going to unravel. I just laid it on him. And you know what he said to me? Oh, so you're going to be one of those pastors and churches that are going to tell people who they can marry and not marry. He just got mad. He got up and left. They don't want to listen. And it's painful to watch someone making, you know, deliberately making destructive choices. I don't know what happened to him. Amaziah says, stop. I don't want to listen. Painful to watch. Painful to read the rest of Amaziah's story. So I wonder if you're here. And you're not only not all in, you're not only not somewhat in, you're barely in with God. Your life is in a major drift, and you've refused godly counsel, and parts of your life are crumbling and falling apart. And you're battling pain. Maybe you're confused. Maybe it's a major addiction issue for which you have not sought help. Maybe you're thinking my finances are completely out of control. I don't even know how I can trust God in this area of my life. In all of these things, God can help you. He can help rebuild your life. He can bring healing and restoration. And maybe you're sitting there and thinking, yeah, listen, preacher, you're standing up there. I'm sitting down here. You have no idea the kind of mess my life is in. No one has the power to help me. How much power do you need? How much power do you need? See, God has the power to create the universe. He has the power to bring down plagues and part the sea. He has the power to raise up rulers and bring down nations. He has the power to calm the storm and heal the sick and cleanse the lepers and raise the dead and cast out demons. God's power is greater than your weakness. God's grace is greater than your shame. God's promises are greater than your past. His capacity to redeem and restore is greater than the sin and disgrace you might be feeling right now. So how much power do you need? God is all the power you need and more. Don't be like Amaziah and resist him. Decide today to not just be somewhat in or barely in. Decide to be all in. All in. Because if you decide to ignore God's ways, small compromises will lead to major drift. And then it leads to stage four. It's painful to watch, painful to read Amaziah's story. His judgment is now clouded with pride and arrogance. He no longer sought after God. He picked a fight with a neighboring king and was soundly defeated. His kingdom was looted. He was left bereft of any power and any influence as a leader. See, if you don't do course correction, if you don't come to God and confess and repent and get right with God. See, when, you, when you're barely in, when you're facing a major drift... If you don't do course correction, you'll end up in stage four. And so Amaziah enters stage four of his life, a life of insignificance. Verse 25 tells us, Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, lived for 15 years. Now from verse 1, we know he ruled for 29 years. And this whole chapter is talking about the first 14 years of his life. And he goes through these three stages in 14 years. What happened in the remaining half of his adult life? What happened in the 15 years before he died? Here's what happened. Nothing happened. Nothing remarkable happened. We don't hear anything about the second half of Amaziah's reign. 
He lived in seclusion and fear, 15 years of insignificance, irrelevance, until he was assassinated. It's a sad ending to a story of a young man who started off with so much promise and so much potential. And I wonder if anyone here is in stage four, you've refused to get right with God. You're not all in, you're not somewhat in, you're not barely in, you're not in at all. And your life is a life characterized by fear and a deep sense of anxiety with no sense of rootedness or direction. And you know what? I'm telling you, you can live that way for 15 years. You can live that way until you die. Or you can decide today, I'm going to be all in with God. I'm going to be all in with God. Join in this grand adventure he's calling us to. So word gets around that Jesus is this powerful rabbi who's doing amazing things with people. Word gets around that he's performing this fantastic miracles. Word gets around. News just spreads and large crowds of people come and follow him. Then Jesus started to teach and explain, here's what it means to be an all-in disciple. What it was going to involve and how there was a cost involved. And then the Bible says this. This is really sad. John 6, 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Now, at first glance, it seems like Jesus really did not do a very good job of influencing people and winning friends that day, right? But see, the whole point of Jesus' teachings was to make a fair disclosure of the fact that we cannot follow him long-term with divided hearts. We are to love him with all our hearts. And so the ones with the divided hearts... They left. They turned back. If you're here and you're not, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you're here and you're living your life all in, I just want to say to you, where to go? Don't stop. Keep pressing on. If anyone is here is barely in or somewhat in and some area of your life, Jesus is not Lord, then this is decision time. Will you like some of the disciples in John 6 turn back? Or will you do what Amaziah did and decide to walk away from God? Or as I hope, you will decide today, you know what, today's the day I'm going to be all in. No more compromises, amen. No more drift. See, our life is about discovering and learning and stretching and growing by following the Lord who calls us to a risky, sometimes demanding, often countercultural way of life. And it, means, it means loving God with all our hearts, all in. It means it's going to cost you something. It means denying ourselves and picking up our crosses daily. It means taking on the yoke of Christ. It means talking to Him and following His lead every single day. It means allowing Him access to every part of our lives. It means taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ. That's where the fullness of life is. Anything else is settling for less than who you and I were meant to be. There's no other way to lead a meaningful life. You know, Amaziah's story is told in one of the places in the Bible, in 2 Kings 14. And the writer of 2 Kings 14 repeats the story pretty much the same way as 2 Chronicles 25, except it adds this one little detail. It says, Amaziah was not like David. He was not like David. Too bad. Too bad. <laughs> That's right. Now, David wasn't perfect. His failures are almost as well known as his successes, but he had a heart that was different from Amaziah's. The Bible tells us when it came to picking David, God looked at his heart, and God is still looking at our hearts. He's looking for open hearts and tuned in hearts and humble hearts and searching hearts and committed hearts. See, David's heart just swelled with love for God and love for the house of God. He writes in Psalm 27, 4, he says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. Amen. I want a heart like that. So do you. Me too. Amen. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> a little child shall lead them. See, a heart like David's is so tuned into God that uncommon boldness, radical faithfulness, unshakable love become the hallmarks of such a heart. A heart like that will worship God, a God that is bigger than all the Goliaths and bears and lions that life can bring. It will beat with a rhythm of grace and love toward people. It will pulse it with passionate worship and bold prayers. It will be filled with a breathtaking vision, walking in tandem with a God whose will will be done, whose kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. So would you stand with me and take out that little post-it heart and just hold it. Hold it for a moment. Be in the overflow room. 
Uh, you have these in your insert. Just hold it out. Everyone just hold this up. This represents your heart. And maybe, maybe you're all in. And I'm going to invite our worship team to, yes, amen. <laughs> maybe you're all in. And if you're all in, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what we're going to do. As the, as the worship team starts singing, I'm going to ask everybody to move to your right and just come out of that way. We took out some of the chairs and then come around to the cross and then just as a physical act, just put this heart-shaped post-it note representing your heart on the cross and just say, from this day on, I'm all in. If you're all in, then just come forward and make a commitment and say, Jesus, I'm all in. If you're somewhat in, then just say, God, I confess in this area of my life, I have not made you Lord. And from this day on, I want you to be Lord of all of my life. I'm all in. If you're barely in, then come and just throw yourself recklessly at God's mercy. Best place to be. It's God's grace. And just put that heart in. If you're not in at all, just come and say, Lord, I don't fully get this, but I'm going to trust you. So as Mary starts to play, would you just start moving? Just move to your right and then just come forward. It's a physical act. We had an amazing couple of services. And we're going to transform this cross with our hearts. Just the way it looks. Just come and just start putting this as a physical act of saying, Lord, I am all, I'm all in. I want to be drenched in this moment. Beauty of our Lord. In Psalm 13, David says, I, I trust in your unfailing love. To that we can add God's recklessly unfailing love. My heart rejoices, David says, in your salvation. I want a heart like that. You want a heart like that. I hope we all walk out of here with hearts and minds resolved not to seek a safe, easy, reassuring spiritual passage from this life to the next but that each of us will resolve to be a more thoughtful, re reflective, urgent, egalitarian, globally active, culturally engaged, Jesus-centered disciple whose life is characterized as courageous, innovative, bold, risk-taking, and soaked in prayer. That'd be cool. So for those of us who call DRCC a home church, I'm going to ask you to do two things in this season ahead. Number one, would you commit to praying? Would you commit to praying? Pray that the unity that the Lord has given us among our elders, trustees, and staff will just extend to our whole congregation that we would be united in the vision God is giving us. And then number two, would you make a commitment to make a commitment? Make a commitment to make a commitment to follow God's heart for our future and what that means for you as an individual or you as a family. Just say, Lord, I'm open to whatever it is you have. I'm all in. I trust you. I want my heart to delight in you. And I'm making a commitment to make a commitment. I'm all in. Just show me what you want me to do. And next weekend, I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens when a church gets filled with people whose hearts are all in with God. There was once such a church. And we're going to take a look at how we can be like that church. Let's pray. Lord, it's about the heart. I pray for each and every one of us within the sound of my voice, Lord. I pray that we would not be barely in or somewhat in that we would be a bunch of disciples who would be resolved to be all in with Christ for the rest of our lives. And so we ask you, God, would you search our hearts? Right now in this holy moment, would you search our hearts? All the sins of the past, maybe this just this past week, we bring foot of the cross and we ask would you cover it with your blood we confess we repent and we seek your forgiveness 
And we pray for healing to happen in every heart in this room and in the overflow room. Lord, I just pray that you would cleanse our hearts, that you would take out the stony hearts and give us hearts of flesh, that your words would be written on our hearts. Nothing is more important than that. And so, Lord, as we walk out of those two doors here and doors of the overflow room, I just pray that we would walk out pledging our foremost allegiance to the crucified carpenter of Nazareth who has captured our hearts, justified our hearts, unified our hearts, and occupied our hearts. Lord, we bow before you the resurrected Christ and we say thank you thank you for what you've done we love you we trust in your unfailing love and our hearts rejoice in your salvation we pray this in Jesus name and all God's people said amen amen if you need prayer some of us are going to be here we'd love to pray with you if you're visiting with us please stop by the welcome center we would love to place a gift in your hand God bless you friends